We've talked about horror auteur Kiyoshi Kurosawa here on the channel before, but it's been quite a while. For that reason, some reintroductions are in order. Last year, we discussed perhaps Kurosawa's best-known project, Cure, a psychological thriller concerning the malleability of humanity. Today we'll be taking a look at one of Kurosawa's other best-known films this side of the Pacific. This time, we've got a cerebral, creeping horror project concerned primarily with human connection and loneliness. Before we delve deeper into Kurosawa's twisted head trip of a film, however, let's look back at the man himself, where he came from, and what got him to this point in Japanese film history. Some of you may know Kurosawa from his horror pieces like Pulse and Cure, or his even more recent forays into drama like Tokyo Sonata, another international success. What may surprise some of you, however, is that Kurosawa didn't always have a reputation for making highly tense, atypical dramatic pieces. Kurosawa was born on July 19, 1955 in Kobe, Hyogo Prefecture. Kurosawa had more humble and typical beginnings than one might expect, attending Riko University in Toshima, Tokyo, where he earned his degree in sociology. After having covered Cure and looking forward to Pulse, that sociology degree makes a lot more sense. While attending Rikkyo University, and in keeping with some other directors we've examined, Kurosawa began making films with his classmates. Upon graduation, filmmaking transitioned from a passion to a career. Just like a number of directors we have and will talk about on this show, Kurosawa got his break directing Pink Film throughout the 1970s and 1980s, before transitioning into other fields. In the 80s, Kurosawa garnered a bit of a reputation for his oddball, genre-blending style. This was facilitated into the 1990s with the advent of V-Cinema, or Video Cinema, what we in America would call the straight-to-video market. While approaching the new millennium, Kurosawa released no fewer than 19 films between 1992 and 1999 perhaps his most prolific period. Most of these projects fell into the categories of either the aforementioned V-Cinema or TV movies. With the majority of his career up to this point being filled with low-budget releases for various markets, Kurosawa revisited an earlier genre, horror, something he hadn't properly touched since 1989 with Sweet Home. It's debatable to an extent whether Sweet Home was even entirely Kurosawa's project, but and that's a story for another day. After the international success of Cure, it seemed that Kiyoshi Kurosawa was poised to become one of the modern masters of Japanese horror. However, true to form, Kurosawa kept mixing things up. He directed film after film, at this point slowing to about one film release per year. And each successive project had its own unique ideas and atmospheres to explore. In 2001, however, Kurosawa surprisingly came back to horror before another extended vacation from the genre. This time around, he delivered Pulse, another tense, get-under-your-skin, creepy film speculating on the future of the internet and human connection. If you're like us, and you grew up in America during the J-horror boom of the early 2000s, you'd be forgiven for having missed this film. Amidst the rings and juons peppering the blockbuster store walls, Pulse had a bit of a complicated time getting into our video stores and homes. And there's a good reason for that. Well, not a good reason, but an understandable one. See, way back in the early 2000s, when Hollywood producers and executives began to fully comprehend the gold mine that existed in Asian horror, specifically Japanese horror, everyone's favorite convict, Harvey Weinstein, had the bright idea to buy up a few of these titles. Please note, I don't know if Weinstein was the one to actually have the idea initially, but it was his company that did it, so... One of Weinstein's companies, Miramax, purchased the rights to Pulse upon its initial Japanese release in 2001. They weren't interested in distributing the film, however. Oh no. Miramax wanted the rights, lock, stock, and barrel, because this would include remake rights. Why have the original film competing in your territory, when you can produce your own version, lock the original out, and make money off of your film exclusively? Luckily, Magnolia Pictures saved Pulse from this Miramax-imposed obscurity in 2005, releasing the film onto DVD in early 2006. This was likely at least partially opportunistic timing, given that the Weinstein Company slash Dimension Films remake was seeing its own release in late summer 2006. We're not sure whether the American film was stuck in development hell long enough for this deal to happen, though it seems likely. Apparently, in 2003, horror legend Wes Craven was attached as both writer and director. 
His screenplay was so butchered, however, that Craven told Fangoria in August 2006, quote, I have had no influence at all on the film they are about to release, end quote. Whatever the case, Kurosawa got the last laugh in a sense, given that Americans were able to purchase or rent his film a full six months before the newer film. Weinstein and company may have wanted to lock the original film in a vault, but after five years of stalling, they couldn't outlast what hype existed for Kurosawa's film in America. Given the discrepancy between the average scores of both films, yeah, we're not thinking that there's much competition between these two. Believe it or not, the American version even received two direct-to-DVD sequels, both in 2008. Both of these were received, well, even worse than the American remake. Outside of Kiyoshi Kurosawa adapting his original film to novel in the same year as the film's original release, there's not much else to say about Pulse outside of the project itself. Said book was translated into French, but sadly no English translation here for our English-speaking audience. About a decade after Magnolia Pictures' release of the film on DVD, the good folks over at Arrow Video bought up distribution rights for Kurosawa's 2001 classic horror film, and finally put it on Blu-ray in the US and the UK. With this upscaled version of the project in tow, let's jump into Pulse and see what makes this dark beast tick. I'm kind of surprised you didn't make a Pulse-related pun. Oh, damn it! But before we dive into the film proper, we'd like to direct you to another video. We've partnered up with fellow YouTuber Spooky Race to do a simultaneous release of two videos concerning Pulse. For those who have watched our remade Suicide Club and Noriko's Dinner Table episode, you'll recall that Spooky gave us a shout out in his own Suicide Club video a while back, which in turn inspired us to go ahead with some remakes of older videos. Well, after that we got to talking and decided to try out this format. One episode of Cinema Nippon and one of Disturbing Breakdown, released on the same day. Spooky Rice's channel is one which, in his own words, quote, dives into the extreme cinema that has shocked film watchers ever since their release, end quote. If you'd like another take on Pulse after ours, be sure to go check out his disturbing breakdown of the film, which we'll link in the card and description. On that note, let's jump into the film proper and our take on it. Pulse follows the simultaneous progression of two stories at once. In one narrative, we have a young sociology student named Kawashima, who's looking for some help setting up his brand new internet connection. Being somewhat computer illiterate and unable to figure it out himself, Kawashima journeys to his university to seek some tech support, which he finds in the form of Harue, a comp sci student. Together, the two get into conversations about philosophy, life, death, and loneliness. All of this because Kawashima has accidentally stumbled upon a phenomenon known as the Forbidden Room, in which Kawashima witnesses numerous anonymous computer users wasting away endlessly in front of their old, chunky PCs. The rumor going around is that the Forbidden Room has something to do with ghosts entering into our realm. Part of the disagreement between Harue and Kawashima is that Kawashima refuses to believe in ghosts, making him willfully ignorant of the Forbidden Room and its effects. Hathaway, meanwhile, says she has always been lonely, and is thus susceptible to the Forbidden Room. At the same time, we follow a slightly larger group, Michi, Junko, Yabe, and Taguchi, who all work in a greenhouse together. Taguchi goes missing before the film begins, with Michi checking out his place. She recovers Taguchi only to witness him hang himself. From here, it's one after another with these kids. Yabe finds a forbidden room and becomes depressed. Then Junko finds Yabe as Michi did Taguchi. Junko becomes equally despondent and lost. In this way, it's a cycle of depression and loss between these four. Of course, the two stories cross paths, though we can't really get into that without major spoilers for the film. That being said, we'll cover that later on, but we'll warn you ahead of time. If you've not seen the film yet, we can't recommend it enough for fans of horror, especially the creeping, crawling type. Aesthetically, Pulse is remarkably Silent Hill-esque. Both its soundtrack and sound direction are notable in this regard. The film's soundtrack is composed mostly of ambient music, which leaves you asking if you're hearing sound effects or music at all. Again, much like Akira Yamaoka's beautifully disturbing Silent Hill work, when the film isn't confusing you with these musical moments, the sound design is reminiscent of some of Silent Hill's most memorable moments, like the apartment whisper in Silent Hill 2. with dead silent ASMR speckling the narrative of Pulse. Dusk. 
Overall, Pulse is awesome as a film, which understands the need for great sound as well as great visuals, offering the perfect marriage for a horror fan. On the visual front, Pulse presents us with grungy, digitized, VHS-quality film, which desperately begs you to lean in and get a better look. It truly captures that late night, early 2000s horrific atmosphere inspired by searching around on the internet way after you should have gone to bed. That being said, Pulse is exceptional in how it commands tension. The film rarely relies on jump scares for cheap thrills, instead allowing the audience to build themselves up through the constant, unclear view of anything supernatural presented. It's an insidious method of horror storytelling and the film is all the more memorable for it. For anyone interested, be sure to check out Pulse. You might be scratching your head come the narrative's end, but you won't be disappointed. For those who have seen the film, and who are interested in just what they might have been watching, let's dive into the themes and meanings of Pulse. <laughs> Pulse deals primarily with the issues presented in modern human connection. This is expressed most directly through a visual simulation upon which Kawashima stumbles in the university's computer lab. Haruei explains that this simulation, which may be mistaken for a screensaver or a glitch, is actually an older student's attempt at mapping out a simple set of rules. A number of dots are shown on screen, they're drawn together if they get too far apart, and they blink out if they make direct contact with one another. This dot simulation represents the theme of the film in microcosm, the difficulties we experience as individuals attempting to become close with other humans, and how these difficulties are exacerbated by telecommunication technologies. Essentially, what we mean to say is that Pulse tends to believe that computers and telephones are intended to draw us together to increase communication between individuals. Instead, what they do is encourage us to distance ourselves physically and emotionally from others. They act as an easy method to speak with other humans, yet so much is lost in translation that they further break down communication. In fact, a large part of the film's view seems to be that, with or without technology aiding us, we as individuals are alone. This is because as autonomous organisms, we can never fully connect with other people. In other words, we value our individuality and we value human contact, without ever acknowledging the irony of the two. This loneliness is expressed time and again by others, something we'll be getting into momentarily. Getting back to the dot simulation in a more literal sense, however, this simple explanation of the film's values expresses how the characters of Pulse interact, and why they pursue the paths they do throughout the film. The phenomenon of two dots being drawn together when one drifts too far is seen perhaps most directly whenever a character enters the Forbidden Room. We hear early on the urban legend about these rooms, doors covered in red tape that people ought to avoid at all costs, yet for one reason or another, multiple protagonists are drawn to the Forbidden Room. This is the maximum distance the dot simulation will allow our characters to reach before they rubber band back together. As one person enters the Forbidden Room, someone else close to them begins to seek them desperately, meaning that the first person has gone too far. When the second individual finds the first and makes contact, such as with Taguchi at the film's opening, or Yabe about halfway through, the first human will suddenly transform into burn marks on the surface closest to them. We're made to ask at this point, through visual trickery, if the second person in the scene is seeing a ghost, a hallucination, or a memory of the first person. What we believe is important here is that the two dots have touched, meaning one has to disappear. This happens in two situations. With the group in the greenhouse, we see a bunch of humans opening themselves up to those who are familiar. This makes it natural that they would seek out one another when a group member disappears. With Kawashima and Haruei, on the other hand, we have two individuals lonely to the point that they'll open up to strangers, who seem equally vulnerable. In the former situation, this proves helpful, with at least one individual being pulled from the Forbidden Room early, while in the latter situation, it causes a good deal of self-destruction. Whether their eventual contact and disappearance is meant to represent that they have lost their individuality, or they've been relegated to memory, it's hard to say. But that's one of the mysteries Pulse explores what exactly the afterlife might be. 
Before we get to the other side, however, we ought to examine what the infection our characters carrying from the Forbidden Room might actually be. It appears, in simplest terms, to be a strong depression or an all-encompassing melancholy that takes them over upon entering the red-taped room. Whether this is a symptom of the infection itself, whatever it is, the phenomenon appears to express itself through the symptoms of depression. Characters will switch in an instant, becoming despondent, non-communicative, and drastic in their loneliness. Hathaway has perhaps the most notable character shift which is observed in how lonely and depressed she becomes. We would argue, however, that this is for a very specific reason on the film's part. See, with regards to the greenhouse employees who become infected earlier, we don't know them well enough to know whether they're predisposed to depression, or whether this is new to them. Specifically, we don't know about Taguchi, who's already gone by the film's opening. But with Yabe, Junko, and Michi, they're all given a little character development, but not enough for us to observe their earlier mental state. With Kawashima and Haraway, on the other hand, we spend enough time with them prior to their awareness of the infection and the Forbidden Room's danger that we can determine what their baseline is. The Greenhouse Gang, meanwhile, is already in the throes of panic when we join them. Thus, the mental and emotional shift becomes obvious when we see it in Harue. We said this seems to be intentional, however, as structurally, we have to ask if this is the truth, or whether we're being deceived. Are we a truly dispassionate observer of Harue's change, or are we in Kawashima's shoes, merely seeing her expressions, her true feelings, for the first time? In other words, have we only just gotten close enough to her to learn she's always been this lonely? She says this, after all. Alternatively, are we meant to believe that it's the infection making her say these things? Do we take the pessimistic view that she's never been happy, or the optimistic view that it's all the sickness's fault? In short, have we, the viewers, gotten close to her to the point that we're making her disappear? By extension, we have to ask if Kawashima is not prone to the infection due to his refusal to look at the ghosts and accept them when he himself ends up in the Forbidden Room. After all, he makes it out on his own, where all the other characters seem to need more direct help escaping. On the other hand, we may ask if Kawashima has never been depressed, meaning he's simply not prone to the call of the void being emitted by the Forbidden Room. Haraway and the others who get infected all comment on their profound sense of loneliness. Kawashima, meanwhile, doesn't express this until directly confronted with it after his encounter with the broom. This occurs when Harue and Kawashima first cross over into what we can assume is the afterlife, a world ravaged by this infection in the blink of an eye, or an alternate dimension from which the ghosts of the film continue to pour into our own. In this realm, there is no one, in spite of the distant sounds of police sirens and a jetliner crashing down. At this point, we ask, is this what the characters who were previously infected meant by loneliness? Are we following Kawashima so closely that only now we see the world how he sees it? Is it meant to be as though these two have become the ghosts? Or is this real? Has the entire world been lost? Whatever the case, this realm helps explain that the ghosts on the other side are just as lonely, sad, and depressed as the living. Kawashima is told this by the ghost he encounters in the Forbidden Room. Prior to this encounter, however, we are left to ask why everyone grows so despondent at their experiences in the room. In essence, they sought out the room for sheer curiosity, only to discover the truth about death, that it's not a reprieve as many of the humans may believe. The Lonely World may also be the other side as made available by the Forbidden Room, another dimension, in other words. We're made to ask during the initial telling of the urban legend whether there have been two dimensions. The Forbidden Room is here explained as a trap created using red tape. Once constructed, it will gather those from the other side, at which point the room can be opened or destroyed, either way letting the trapped one out into our own world. In this conception, we're meant to ask whether two alternate dimensions exist simultaneously, ours and what we would call the ghost realm with a rip being created in one and the inhabitants there spilling over into ours. If we assume this to be true, are the ghosts somehow infected with this sadness, meaning they're now infecting our own world's inhabitants? Or are they fundamentally incompatible with our humans, leading to melancholy as an expression of this? 
In a way, the film seems to argue that the inception of telephones, computers, and the internet have created something of a pocket ghost realm in our own world, a miniature forbidden room. During one argument, Harue insists to Kawashima that the people they've been shown online time and again are no different than ghosts. She begs the question of who they are and why they're here. We don't know who they are. They are shown to be alone by their computers, and they all seem just as disconnected as a ghost is from their living world. It might seem like a heavy-handed way of expressing this theme, but there may be some merit to Harue's idea of becoming living ghosts. Some believe ghosts to be replaying ethereal memories, committing the same actions time and again because they're stuck in a time loop. Here, Harue seems to ask, is our reliance on computers and the internet much different than replaying the same actions over and over? The truly horrifying moment on this front comes when Harue comes face to face with a ghost, though this scene is equally one of the film's most understated. She's watching herself on her computer monitor, meaning that she's seeing through the eyes of one of these beings, standing behind her and merely observing. Harue turns and, without a word, steps closer and closer to the ghost, begging for closeness. She tries to hug the unseen force, with the tension mounting in the scene as we observe equally from the ghost's view. Harue is asking us, the ghost observing her from a different time and space, to comfort her. There's no jump scare here, with the revelation that there is nothing perceptible standing before her. Instead, Hathaway has become so sad and lonely that she'll try anything. The very computer sitting behind her has failed her. She sees no genuine human contact through that avenue anymore, to the point that she's willing to try and hug a ghost for contact. Pulse seems to believe that we have an illusion through the rapid spread of technology. We think we're more connected than ever, yet we remain as individuals. As Harue shows, we humans look anywhere for a bond, no matter how futile. Only when those who have seen the Forbidden Room realize that there is no escape through death do they give up and succumb to their loneliness. As we see with the film's closing, those left without seeing this reality will go as far as they can, even across the globe, to find other humans. We're so motivated by this contact that we're meant to ask at the end, are we better off being ignorant of this worldview and remaining happy and functional, like Kawashima? Or are we better becoming borderline pessimistic and cynical and just giving up? Our reality, according to Pulse, revolves around the dot simulation. We seek contact, but fear coming too close to others. The film provides no answers for how we ought to live our lives in the bounds of this setup. It merely asks, how do you want to live? Thanks for watching the video today, everyone. This one was a doozy in terms of scripting and analysis because so much of what Kurosawa seemed to be doing here is abstract. We'd love to hear in the comments below what you think the meaning behind the film might be, as we're pretty sure there will be a number of other takes on Pulse. Speaking of other takes, don't forget to go check out the link in the description to Spooky Rice's video about Pulse. The guy does good work over on his channel, covering some films I'm even too squeamish to sit through. 